The information is reporting that the AI progress is grinding to a halt. OpenAI shifts strategy as rate of GPT AI improvement slows. Following OpenAI, Google changes tack to overcome AI slowdown. And how AI researchers are rising above scaling limits. Get over here and hit like. This is no time to freeze. And they started this article saying, now that we know that OpenAI isn't the only artificial intelligence developer seeing a slowdown in improvements using traditional scaling methods, they cite their source here, as you can see this link. And the source is the other article they wrote where they're saying, you know, here they're saying Google is slowing it down and they're saying it's similar to OpenAI slowing down and they, they link their source, which is the other article that they wrote about it. And here they give us a few details about what's happening. So they're saying the increase in quality, so of the Orion model, right? So sort of the next big release that we're waiting for. The increase in quality was far smaller compared with the jump between GPT-3 and GPT-4. And this is according to some OpenAI employees that have tested Orion and that Orion performs better at language tasks, but may not outperform previous models on tasks such as coding. And they're saying basically this would mean that the sort of scaling laws are being tested here. This is our core assumption that the more compute and data and sort of training runs, how long they are that we throw at these models, the better they become. So more is more. Those are the scaling laws and they are what we believed to be true this whole time. And so the information is kind of suggesting that, well, we reach kind of the end of the scaling laws. The quick and easy gains are over and now it's going to get much harder to keep improving these models, that there's a wall. Sam Altman replies, jumps in saying, there is no wall. Now, of course, some might say, well, Sam Altman, he has incentive to kind of keep pumping the AI hype, etc. But here's the thing. A lot of the people that have left OpenAI, for example, some of these safety researchers that were concerned that there wasn't enough of a focus on safety, they're not pumping their bags, so to speak. And... Uh, they're not saying that there's a wall or some sort of a slowdown. They're saying the exact opposite. They're saying this thing is going fast and we need to be like a little bit more cautious. If we reach some sort of a natural slowdown, so to speak, a natural plateau in AI progress, they would not be as worried because that would mean more time for them to figure out, you know, AI safety, alignment, etc. There is, however, one person who is just absolutely ecstatic about there being a potential AI slowdown. That man is Gary Marcus. Gary Marcus is kind of a fascinating character in this whole AI landscape. I feel like whenever AI does anything wrong, it says something wrong or, you know, pictures missing a finger or something, just anything that is slightly off, you're going to find Gary Marcus cackling wildly at it and uh, pointing his finger. He loves saying that AI, just the feel as a whole is just not going anywhere. Like that's it, it's done. So here he's saying, so number one, multiple media reports from multiple companies are reporting diminishing returns. Exactly as he warned in 2022 in Deep Learning is Hitting a Wall. So here's his post, uh, Gary Marcus, Deep Learning is Hitting a Wall in March 10th, 2022. Since that blog post, of course, we've had Demi Sasabis and the Google DeepMind team being awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So John Jumper, who's part of that team, they're co-awarded that with a third person that did some work earlier that was not part of Google DeepMind. We are beginning to see AI models designing computer chips that uh, chances are you might have interacted with some technology that uses AI designed computer chips. Alpha Proteo generates novel proteins for biology and health research. So we're actually doing these designer proteins that are able to attach to other target proteins. So for example, this can help with cancer, viruses, various autoimmune conditions. And by basically designing this sort of binder protein, attaching it to the target protein, we're able to have, it's like a control panel for that protein. We're able to interact with it in certain ways. And so far they're testing it with things like infections, cancer, HIV, chronic pain, autoimmune disease. Dennis Asabis is saying we could solve disease in the next uh, couple decades. AI gets the silver medal at the IMO, the International Mathematical Olympiad. By the way, that's even uh, kind of burying the lead a little bit. So it was one point away from gold. And these are some of the hardest math problems in the world that have, uh, include proofs. So it's two models working together, a lot of synthetic data. So the model kind of trains itself. It uses self-play, generates data to improve itself to create these proofs for these math problems. And so the best and smartest people in the world, you know, if they're getting the gold medal, I think it's 29 and above is gold. This AI system out of Google DeepMind misses it by one point, but 
You'll get it next year, I'm sure. At NVIDIA, they're using large language models, GPT-4 in this case, to train robots, like for example, that robotic hand, as well as some other robots, to train them to do complex tasks, such as this pen spinning trick that the hand is doing. So GPT-4 creates these reward functions for training that hand to do it in a simulation, right? So it runs it through that kind of uh, Isaac Jim, or however NVIDIA refers to it as, right? Yeah, I believe this is the Isaac Jim, right? So it's uh, kind of a, a simulation of it doing a thing. It's getting points for doing it right. It gets a negative penalty for doing it wrong, right? Then we get the sort of the results and we give it back to GPT-4 and we're like, here's how well that thing did. So give me some more ideas, like make it better. Right, and it goes and it does it again. It keeps trying this until it's able to teach that robot and inflammation to do things better. Now, the sort of the human researchers that do this, you know, they're usually very advanced in this field, right? So this is like very technical stuff, very uh, hard stuff to do. This isn't just anybody off the street. So they're comparing it to people that are incredibly good at, you know, writing these reward functions that know what they're doing, right? Really high level people. So surely GPT-4 just out of the box is not going to do better than them at training these robots, right? There's no way. But oops, Eureka can generate super human level reward functions. Across 29 tasks, Eureka rewards outperform expert human written ones on 83% of them with an average normalized improvement of 52%. What's really weird here is like as the tasks get more and more complex, the ideas that GPT-4, that this Eureka system provides, it starts kind of deviating from what the humans come up with, right? So the human's like, I think we should do this. And and the system's more like, nope, we're going to do this thing over here. And interestingly enough, it's much better at the harder tasks, right? So meaning it's coming up with these more like alien ideas and those ideas work better than the stuff that our brains come up with. So all that has happened since Gary Marcus back in 2022 has warned us that deep learning is hitting a wall. That's it, game over. And he's not just yelling at Sam Altman here. Thanks to Chubby for posting this uh, because this was on threads. I'm not on threads. Should I be? So this is Jan LeCun. I think most people here in the States would just say LeCun. So whatever you prefer. So he's saying, contrary to Gary Marcus's claim, deep learning is absolutely not hitting a wall. He was wrong when he first said it, which certainly is true, right? That's that's a fact we can see now looking back what it's been two plus years. And he's still wrong about that today. Deep learning is and will remain the foundation of present and future AI systems. Gary's entire career has been built around a battle to bring down connectionism, neural nets, and now deep learning. Evidently, this has become a sad rear guard battle that he has now completely lost. See, Jan, your little like uh, scathing takedowns of, of people, they're so well written. They have that sort of uh, je ne sais quoi. They're just they're beautiful. Why do you waste it on Elon Musk? That I don't understand. Jan, if you weren't aware, he left X slash Twitter. He's an XX user, I guess I should say, and moved to Threads because of his political disagreements with Elon Musk after them kind of like doing battle for a while. But in terms of AI, I think they're aligned. I'm not sure why they're going back and forth at it. But this him going up against Gary Marcus, this is phenomenal. So Gary Marcus replies, you are insanely intellectually dishonest. I was her long before you. Here, I'm guessing, coining the phrase deep learning is hitting a wall in a March 2022 essay and warning that the scaling would run out. So that essay is the one we took a look at earlier. At the time, you attacked me writing, not only is AI not hitting a wall, cars with AI powered driving assistant aren't hitting walls or anything else either. Now, Jan also continues because he's a sort of the guy that's a little bit against, I would say, large language models. He doesn't see them as the path to sort of next level AI to AGI. So he's saying they're useful, but they're not going to get us to the human level AI. So I guess Gary Marcus also posted a follow-up to this. And we're not going to read the whole thing, just one tiny snippet here that I want to point out. So he does mention AlphaFold 3. So some of the sort of the big breakthroughs that I've mentioned um, that came from deep learning after um, Gary Marcus's post were from the Alpha series, right? So we have Alpha Fold, Alpha Proof, Alpha Geometry, Alpha Code, Alpha Chip, I think they're calling it, the chip designer one. And this one is, of course, Alpha Proteo. But here he's mentioning that some of the most impressive results in AI, like Alpha Fold 3, have been hybrids of deep learning and other classical techniques. So I don't really know what to make of this. Uh, it seems to me that deep learning is doing quite a bit. And it's, in fact, kind of uh, advancing rather rapidly. This is a great GIF. GIF, Jeff, I don't care. 
this is this is just phenomenal. I'm sorry, whoever posted this, I you have a like, good sir or madam. So here at Doomy is asking who leaked this to the information. Uh, quoting the article, that one I believe is from How AI Researchers Are Rising Above Scaling Limits, their latest one in this series. So they're saying that uh, one way that staff at Google have been trying to eke out gains by focusing more on settings that determine how a model learns from data during pre-training, a technique known as hyperparameter tuning. It differs from fine-tuning, which involves making changes to models after pre-training so they are better at specific tasks, such as coding. And the, the joke here is that this is basically not a huge leak. It's not a uh, groundbreaking new information that we've never seen before. Now, to be fair, they did say there are tried and true methods to make the LM models perform better, such as tweaking the parameters. And so this was an example of some of the more common techniques. The new strategies are hot off the presses. I think they're referring to the MIT study slash paper that was released that was called the shocking effectiveness of test time training for abstract reasoning. Actually, it says surprising, the surprising effectiveness. If the MIT can say surprising, why can't I put shocking in my titles? What's what's wrong with that? I'm hoping to cover this in a different video because it was, uh, it's a few days old at this point, but it's it's an interesting paper, in part because they're talking about the ARC benchmark, uh, which is, it's going to be an interesting subject to cover in a different video. And so the ARC prize uh, developed by Francois Cholet is basically a benchmark that's going to be kind of hard for these large language models to just ace 100%. So a lot of the tests that we're giving them, let's say like the, the standard benchmarks that are used for, for coding, for languages, for reasoning, et cetera, they might be beaten with memorization. So this is supposed to test how well the models are actually able to think and reason, right? So if you think about it, like we don't want the large language models just spitting out stuff they've memorized that has to be sort of, we're trying to test to see if they have intelligence that's like human intelligence. So we're trying to design a test for that. And that's what the ARC AGI is. And so it looks like the ARC AGI 2024 high scores, right? So we have the leaderboard verification in progress and the winners are going to be announced on December 6th. So stay tuned for that. And so it looks like right now, this is on Kaggle.com, the ARC Prize 2024. The top scores are, looks like 55.5. And the grand prize is unlocked by any team that reaches at least 85%. So reaching that 85% would kind of show us that, yeah, we have something that's like AGI. At least, you know, according to this test, this benchmark, that would be sort of equivalent, right? So as they're saying here, this ARC AGI is the only formal benchmark of AGI. It's easy for humans, but hard for AI. So here they have an example of what those kind of look like. So I hate doing these on camera because whenever I get something wrong, like a million of you are dunking on me in the comments. And just with the amount of people that see this, if I get anything wrong, somebody's going to notice it. I've considered editing out the parts where I get things wrong so I don't look like an idiot, but it just doesn't feel authentic. So it means, yes, I got it. Look at that confetti. Obviously, this one is uh, super simple, but I'll leave the link in the show notes if you want to test these out for yourself, if you dare. But the whole sort of uh, point behind this thing is it's not as easily cracked by large language models as some of these other tests. So if we're looking at Hella Swag, MMLU, GSM, 8K, et cetera, where I see these blue lines are sort of like, you know, years since benchmark introduction, as you can see, the models just like shoot upwards and go past human capability rather quickly. Like this line is the five-year mark. Here, however, the yellow, that's the ARC AGI. And certainly it's jumped up since the ARC prize launch. So the grand prize of, so it looks like a million plus uh, spread across various prizes. But as you can see, so far has been sort of resistant to, uh, you know, being easily solved. And by solved, I mean breaking through the human capability sort of threshold. So earlier this month or late last month, I think Sam Altman said that one of the things that they're going to be doing in 2025 is uh, saturating all benchmarks. Meaning basically, we're going to push the model's capabilities on all these benchmarks to the the absolute maximum, like once you start approaching 100%, right, it gets like harder and harder to tell if it's getting better or not. You're saturating, you're getting as, as close as you can get possibly. And so we hear this person saying scaling has hit a wall and that wall is 100% eval saturation, right? That's kind of like the, the wall that we're going to hit. That's the only wall we're going to hit. So that's Will Depew. And David responds with, what about Cholette's arc eval? And that's been kind of like the big question, like, okay, yeah, we can 
maximize all of those other benchmarks. But what about the arc eval, the thing that's like sort of designed to be, you know, easier for humans, very difficult for large language models because it's more aligned with like human intelligence and how we can process stuff versus large language models. And guess who jumps in to answer the question? Mr. Sama himself, Sam Altman, he's saying in your heart, do you believe we've solved that one or no? So we're going to see who's wrong, who's right. So the information has been so far a very credible source, a very informed source. Now it seems like the sort of narrative that they're pushing across multiple articles now is in conflict with what a lot of the people that are the AI insiders are saying, and not just like the CEOs of the companies, the founders, but also the researchers. So time will tell. But before you go, I do want to ask you a question, and that is in your heart. Do you believe that OpenAI has solved that one or no? So just put down in the comments, yes, if you think that OpenAI has a model out there that is able to crack 85% on the Archival. So again, if, if these uh, sort of people on the internet, right, if they're getting 55.5, some of them are just one-member teams, Tu Min Deng, William Wu, we have Pu AI, etc. They're getting 55.5 and 85 is the threshold for that human capability to win the, the grand prize. Do you think that OpenAI, with whatever models they have behind the scenes, the models that aren't gated in any way, that have no guardrails, right? Kind of like the fully unleashed models with all their compute that's available to them. Keep in mind, the whole point of that article and the paper that was released is that we can make massive improvements in the AI's abilities by just letting it think more before it gives an answer. So that test time compute, right? So the idea of the test time training, right? The surprise of effectiveness on this, keep in mind. So this is uh, MIT publishing this. So they're saying we achieved 53% accuracy on the ARC public validation set. And by assembling our method with recent program generation approaches, we get state-of-the-art public validation accuracy of 61.9 matching the average human score. So I haven't looked at that paper yet, so I apologize if I'm maybe uh, confusing some things or whatever. Some of the numbers that I'm saying might be a little bit off. So um, we'll do a full deep dive into this in one of our next videos. But if a lab at MIT can kind of like spin up their own uh, open source model and then get those kind of results, again, in your heart of hearts, do you think perhaps OpenAI already broke that barrier, whether that's... Uh, the ArcGI grand prize or the, the human capability if those are two separate benchmarks. So it looks like ArcGI is saying 85 is the threshold, but it seems like when other people are kind of studying this stuff, this, uh, from, for example, from Center for Data Science at New York University, right? So they're saying that it should be slightly lower, the, the average sort of human ability, it shouldn't be 85. They're saying we estimate that average human performance lies between 73 and 77 percent, between 55 and 60, let's say, you know, 69 correct, with a reported empirical average of 64 percent. But the question is, do you think that some model deep inside OpenAI could get that 85 percent, right, and take the grand prize on that challenge if OpenAI was willing to submit it, which, which they, they, they don't. There's some, you have to, like, disclose a lot of stuff. It has to be, I think, offline and stuff like that. So they're not going to do it. They're not going to take the prize. But if they were willing to do that and play by the rules, do you think they have some solution to this, right? As Sam Altman saying here, in your heart, do you believe we've solved that one or no? If you think yes, write yes in the comments. If you think no, put no. I'm curious to know what you all think. With that said, my name is Wes Roth. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.